Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to today's ACM uh, Learning Webinar. This uh, webcast is part of uh, ACM's commitment to uh, lifelong learning, and this webinar is uh, brought to you by the Special Interest Group for Artificial Intelligence, and uh, specifically the CGI Industry Committee. Uh, we're planning uh, to have uh, monthly webinars. This is our second webinar in the series uh, on different topics of interest for those in industry and academics as well. Uh, I'm Plamen Petrov, uh, Industry Liaison Officer for CGI. I'm Director of uh, Cognitive Technology at KPMG LLP and also the Lab Director for the dedicated Intelligent Automation Lab within KPMG Ignition. Uh, my work focuses on areas such as natural language processing, knowledge representation, reasoning, machine learning, and other methods and algorithms. I, I also serve on the faculty of the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I teach graduate courses on artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and cognitive analytics. Also moderating the webinar today with me is Rose Parody. Uh, she's secretary treasurer for CGI. Rose is a uh, principal research engineer for Lidos Health and Life Sciences, where she works as a data scientist for uh, big data analytics that includes building models in computational linguistics and natural language processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and just uh, briefly, today's presentation, uh, uh, exciting topic, HTTP NLP, a new NLP system for high throughput throughput phenotyping by Dr. Peter Elkin from uh, University at Buffalo. And uh, a little bit of an uh, overview of ACM, some highlights for those of you who, who may not be uh, familiar with ACM and CGI. Uh, ACM offers uh, educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of uh, computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at uh, learning.acm.org. Uh, you can see some of the highlights on your screen. The ACM uh, Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence is made of uh, academic and industrial researchers, practitioners, software developers, and users, uh, as well as students. And our goal is to promote and support the growth of application of AI principles and techniques uh, uh, through, throughout computing, sponsor or co-sponsor high-quality AI-related conferences, uh, publish the quarterly newsletter, AI Matters, organize the career network and conference, CGI, CNC, for early-stage researchers in AI, uh, sponsor recognized AI awards, promote AI educational and publications, uh, through various forums uh, uh, in the ACM digital library. And as you know, a AI is increasingly an interdisciplinary area, and your membership supports these goals. So uh, uh, you can join us today by going to the link on your screen or Googling SIG AI. Both members and non-members are welcome to join our mailing list to receive timely announcements of interest uh, to researchers and practitioners. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items uh, that are uh, on the slide uh, in front of you. Uh, first, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a, a number of additional widgets and resources you can use. Uh, if you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press F5 key on Windows or Control R on your Mac or refresh your browser on a mobile device, or worst case, you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A box at the time during the webinar, and please press the Submit button. Rose and Plumman uh, organize the questions as Peter speaks, and we'll reserve some time at the end to ask uh, uh, questions. Uh, we usually get quite a few of those. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Uh, and check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. And at the end of the presentation, uh, you will see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it in, fill it out, uh, and uh, that will help us improve our webinars. 
You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the menu dock at the bottom of your screen. All right, so uh, today's presentation is uh, HTP NLP, a new NLP system for high throughput phenotyping by Dr. Peter Alkin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alkin. Uh, Dr. Alkin serves as professor and chair of the University at Buffalo Department of Biomedical Informatics. He's also a professor of internal medicine, surgery, and pathology at UB. Uh, Dr. Alkin has served as a tenured professor of medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. In this capacity, he was the center director of biomedical informatics, vice chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine, and the vice president of Mount Sinai Hospital for Biomedical and Translational Informatics. Uh, prior to Mount Sinai, he was a professor at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Alkin has published over 170 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, he did his internal medicine residency at the Lahey Clinic uh, in his NIH and NLM-sponsored fellowship in medical informatics at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he's the primary author of the ANSI National Standard on Quality Indicators for Controlled Health Vocabularies, ASTM E2087, which has also been approved by ISO as uh, TC215 uh, as a technical specification. He has chaired Health and Human Services HIDSB Technical Committee on, popula uh, on Population Health. And uh, quickly, Dr. Alkin served as the co-chair of the AHIC Transition Planning Group. He's a master of the American College of Physicians and a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, also a fellow of uh, the New York Academy of Medicine. He was the founding chair of the International Medical Informatics Association Working Group on Human Factors uh, Engineering for Health Informatics and editor of the Springer Informatics textbook, Terminology and Terminology Systems. He was awarded the Mayo Department of Medicine's Laureate Award for 2005. And Dr. Alkin is the index recipient of the Homer Warner Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Field of Medical Informatics. Uh, so uh, without much ado, uh, Peter, uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, uh, Plum, and that was a lovely introduction. Um, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about um, natural language processing, but I'm going to talk to you about it in the context of artificial intelligence. And the way that we're thinking about artificial intelligence currently is about human-machine partnerships. The human-machine partnership is not like we used to traditionally where we use machines, but it's where the machine is, a, is an intellectual peer and is working with the human being in order to accomplish tasks. And the basic equation is that, uh, you know, that a, a, an intellectual person with a computer is smarter than one without a computer, and they can be more efficient and can uh, sometimes accomplish tasks that, that neither could accomplish alone. And uh, we have at... In, in my department, we have uh, 30 faculty. Just a quick uh, overview of the department. We've got uh, a master's a PhD program. We've got a number of postdoctoral fellowships, one an NIH fellowship in biomedical informatics from the National Library of Medicine. We have a big data science training program, which I'll talk a little more about, uh, which people can get access to. And actually, in the, the NLM program, we have some short-term training slots that are eight to 12 week experiences in informatics. So if anybody really loves this talk and wants to spend time with us, we have some funding available uh, in a couple of different ways for people to come and, and learn with us. Um, so, you know, traditionally we talk about, we've talked about AI for a long time and everybody's very excited about deep learning. But one of the problems with deep learning, as you know, is that it's non-explainable that you, the deep learning system can't tell you how it arrived at its conclusions. And human beings that you're interfacing with often need to trust the information that they're getting. And being able to give a history of why you believe that an answer that you're providing is the correct answer is uh, comforting to people who are thinking about whether they should follow the advice that's being proffered by the machine. And so uh, explainable AI has taken off uh, in uh, much more earnest uh, since 
uh, the successes of deep learning have been become better known. And uh, and I think that there's more and more professions like medicine that I'm in that are comforted by knowing that people are working on how to actually explain the outcomes that they're finding from the networks that we're creating. Um, you know, as we think about this, you know, tear is human, but machines can really make things worse in some ways. And if we look at machine learning results to date, one of the things that's always challenging is how robust the models that are created are. So if people don't do sensitivity analyses where they have a, a take out one uh, of the variables to serially uh, ran, at random and see how well the uh, the model that they've created is elastic over the range of possible data availability and data sources are, um, then you can find out uh, whether it's a, an elastic or inelastic system. And so with all these models, I would encourage everybody to do sensitivity analyses because we found that some of the models that performed very well were, were very inelastic and ended up uh, uh, being very sensitive to small changes in data availability or uh, being able to um, uh, find enough data in a particular, with a particular variable. Um, so we have to also start thinking about how our AI is used. You know, everybody's seen the Terminator movies and things like that, and that's not the only thing I'm talking about. You know, it, sometimes people repurpose um, intellectual property and intellectual products of uh, artificial intelligence in order to solve a problem that the original model was not intended to solve. Uh, and often that can lead to harm, and so we have to make sure that not just the malevolent AI that, that have people have thought about, like using PKI infrastructure for ransomware and other things that have happened over the last few years, but also we need to think about the ethics behind this, have open discussions on the ethics, and make sure that we build into our artificial intelligence the kind of um, uh, availability to uh, uh, these programmings that ensure ethical design and what that ethical design should be as we go forward. And I think there needs to be research in this area. If you look at where the publications in artificial intelligence are coming from, we're actually second in the United States to China, who are publishing more than we are at the present moment. Uh, and uh, there may be some people from Chinese, but I'm from the United States and that, from China on the phone. But I'm from the United States, so I, I mention it. You can see the other countries that are rated on this scale. This was a, a 2015 publication. And then, uh, you know, we look at uh, one of the ways that we've worked, and I think this is uh, also very interesting to many on the phone, is in uh, taking uh, the literature and using it across articles to create uh, networks of knowledge. <coughs> it's, in medicine, there are somewhat, something like 6,000 articles published every week. And, you know, I think I'm pretty diligent. I read 60 articles last week, but I got 5,940 behind. And uh, people in one field don't read another field's literature, and yet they may be working on some of the same markers or areas where there's great synergy between them. And, and intelligent infrastructures can go out, mine that data, find these networks, and then inform both fields or, or many fields about the, the findings that happened in a particular field. Um, if you look at the science article that came out this year in AI and research, there's quite a number of, uh, of uh, interesting uh, applications that people have been publishing on uh, recently. Some of these we're working on at UB. I'm going to highlight a few of them, but uh, not all of them. We have uh, precision oncology. We have robotic work. Uh, we have uh, validation of intelligent systems that are going on. Not all of these are, are my work, but they're work that's going on at the University of Buffalo. Um, and of course, artificial intelligence doesn't just depend on, uh, on computer science, but there are a number of other fields that interact with artificial intelligence in order to make it work within our social society in a way that could be even uh, possibly acceptable. And, uh, and we have a little wordle of how that fell out in our university. If you think about it, if AI is a core um, application discipline, think of it as a, a um, uh, as a micro credential. You know, uh, then there's disciplinary cores that go around that. 
Then we have legal, ethical, and social implications of what are being done. And then we should build our applications on top of that framework. And I just threw out a few of them that we work on here, smart spaces, precision medicine, and autonomous systems that um, that are, are timely, I believe. The idea is that we have a lot of goals to advance our understanding, design better methods to address problems that are faced, to pioneer uh, advances in AI and in human-machine interaction, and then uh, to become, uh, you know, leaders in this new industry and advance the, uh, the cultural implications of human-machine interaction. So I'm, I'm a physician and a scientist, and so I'm going to give you a lot of examples that are in the health area today because that's where I live and breathe. But many of the things that I'm going to talk about as infrastructure are applicable in many fields. So um, I'm going to talk to you about a study we did on AI-based disease surveillance that had fantastic outcomes. And I believe that the future of AI and health is going to be creating these models so that we create a systematic process of care for physicians to take better care of their patients where computers are working with physicians and patients and their families to create a safer and more effective infrastructure for health. And I know we can do it already. And just some of the things we're going to talk about today are part of, those, of, that, of that overall puzzle. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence informed precision medicine. And uh, I'm going to use the context of a project, project we have with the Veterans Administration to create an electronic tumor board that will be available uh, open source, really, all over the country as it gets finished. Um, and this combines clinical genomic and image data with advanced machine learning techniques to provide uh, advice to a, a physician and a patient as they're deciding what to do about their care and taking input from many different specialties at the same time, and then keeping a living learning system of these so that people and machines can get better over time at taking care of cancer patients. And then uh, humans collaborating with computers toward uh, precision care for that particular individual. This is where we take evidence-based medicine and drill it down to a, another level using genomic and proteomic and and image data to drive decision making. And then AI informed marker driven treatment. So uh, we'll talk about why uh, the marker driven treatment isn't ideal yet and what we're going to be doing about it. It turns out that, that uh, many of these markers that we have in medicine um, pick out populations where only, for example, with EGFR positive lung cancer, non small cell lung cancer only 18.9% of people that you treat will actually respond to the drug. So who are the people that will be responders versus non-responders? And can we get a genetic signature that can tell us who those will be so we won't have so many false positive treatments? Um, and then when to treat people. And then we're creating uh, what we call an informatics laboratory for the analysis of big data, which is, is really teaches a lot about artificial intelligence, but also about the data handling involved in actually practically coming up with artificial intelligence systems. And that will be, that was uh, funded through the National Library of Medicine and will be available to all the training programs and probably open nationally, depending on what the library wants to do, but I would guess they would. We're part of a big data science training uh, fellowship from the VA and the National Cancer Institute. And you can see our fellows there up at the top. Um, and the idea with this fellowship is that PhD scientists come and spend a year uh, with us working at, at the Western New York VA and work with people nationally who are in the program to um, advance their understanding of health data within the VA setting, which is pretty robust. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more and help, uh, and help train them to be good data scientists and, and work in artificial intelligence. And so, um, People who are corporate may want to hire some of these people when they get done, and people who want to send people to the program may want to avail themselves of these funded slots. So I got in, involved in NLP because we have 83% uh, of the data in health is locked in the free text of health records and reports. And these, but, but this, I, I just had to give the, this talk in part to the, the Department of Labor Statistics for the country 
with every department of the government being there because they're now starting to see that uh, they're dealing with such a small fraction of the real data that there's a lot they can do with this data that, that they couldn't do with the structured data they have now. And when you think about it, if you think of all the documents people understand are not structured currently, all of the the reports, all of the legends and figures, all of the tabular data names, and all of the actual field names and databases that are non-standard, um, these can all get normalized using uh, techniques for unstructured data that we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, here are examples of just some data types that are only available from unstructured data. Social determinants of health, which are very important these days, any signs and symptoms patients may have, physical exam findings, counseling, uh, quality of life measures, uh, behavioral data, and, and things like street drug use in, uh, and opinions. So you know the opioid epidemic is, uh, has become a problem for everyone, and so dealing with that takes input. We also always, uh, often get our data from electronic health records, and for those of you who are not in this space, uh, it began in the 60s with the health system in Utah and CoStar at the Massachusetts General. I was pleased to see some of the MGH people on the call. Um, but then they started with commercial systems. So Lockheed had developed a system for El Camino Hospital, which later became TDS. And uh, there was one article that, that if it was in, improperly installed, it could end up killing babies. So it, these things can do harm as well as help uh, patients. Meditech started in 69, MUMPS was developed in about approximately 1977 and became a standard. And then EPIC started as an outpatient uh, system in 79 and Cerner started as a lab system in, at that same time. Uh, Boston Beth Israel had developed a system which then got used by the Brigham in the 80s and then Reagan Street came up with theirs at about the same time. The VA started uh, in this at about 81 with the uh, uh, the distributed hospital computer program, and uh, then uh, it became Vista in about '94, where they uh, out, they rolled out their uh, uh, CPRS, which is their interface, and then and then the country decided that they were going to get EHR adoption to be a main model, and this was an economic driver for the country because they wanted to control costs, and they knew they couldn't control costs without it which was the principal driver behind it. But we doctors were happy because it was also a, uh, a way we could use artificial intelligence to improve care. So uh, we, we created this system, which is called the uh, High Throughput Phenotyping Natural Language Processing System. It, uh, it was developed at the University of Buffalo, and, uh, and we've used it in quite a number of ways already, but this is just one paper that was published out of it where we took uh, our outpatient uh, all scripts data, which had about 7 million notes in it, and we were able to generate in about an hour and a half uh, about almost a billion codes, uh, yeah, a billion codes in SNOMED CT codes from this. And uh, we've uh, found a way to um, take our observational database, and we're using OMOP. We've also used I2B2 in the process. And this is an OMOP Odyssey format that they have. And then take these and to link to it, uh, Berkeley DB NoSQL database. And uh, also, uh, we had some uh, debates within the lab on what's better, a graphical database for the graph data or a triple store. So we actually store our, uh, our graphical outlet output in both the formats so that we could do testing to see what has better performance in what cases and so forth. Uh, we use this big data lake concept uh, with uh, NoSQL and, uh, and Hadoop, and we have a high-performance computing center, one of the NSF-funded supercomputer centers here at UB, which uh, has facilitated a bunch of the work. I want to give them credit and a shout out here. So. Uh, Every talk has to have an obligated joke. I, let me just say NLP can be very challenging. You get uh, different ways of representing data and people speak in different ways and there's a lot of shortcuts that people use. And so uh, so anything that's done to represent the, uh, the content needs to understand the form of the language, the structure of the language, and the, and the colloquial uh, language that's being used. 
So we have this organization of our processor, which has an input processor, an ontologic coder, an output processor. And one of the things that we do in, in doing this is that we create a full semantic intermediary parse, and that semantic intermediary parse is then used to match against any of the ontologies. So we can go through the text once and match to any number of ontologies. So often in medicine, we're using SNOMED for, for uh, findings uh, and diseases, uh, LOINC for lab test names, and, um, and RxNorm for drug names. And then uh, often for genetics, we're using the gene ontology and other ontologies that are part of the OB OBO foundry to create our um, intermediaries. And we can run through as many as we want at the same time, and all that output gets stored in these NoSQL databases. But we also have web services that provide JSON files, and uh, there, there's a, uh, a, a, a queue um, input to the parser and a queue output so that we can just make the throughput very, very fast through this. And we were able to do this comparing to open source things. We were 50 times as fast. And the way we, I like to describe this is we, the reason this works so well and gets such great results is we use ontology at the basis. So, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with ontology, it's a systematic computable way of organizing knowledge. And, and in a good example of this that I like to use is that people come to any particular issue with different perspectives. And if their perspective is valid, they should be able to see exactly their perspective, but also see all the related relevant information exactly in the same organization as they would regardless of how their perspective, someone else's perspective might be different than theirs. So here, for example, is a disease-oriented view of diabetes, uh, talking about the pancreas and its role in the disease, how it affects the liver, adipose tissue, the heart, and the eyes. And if I, if I take another view of this, this is a more molecular view of it from the insulin-producing beta cell and, you know, what the effect is to the metabolism and, uh, and how this is driven by your DNA. And this is a perfectly valid view, too. And what an ontology does is it allows you to support in the same knowledge representation multiple consistent views of the same knowledge. And, and that's a very powerful thing to be able to say and do. And by doing it with natural language processing, you can normalize the codes to meaning. So if there's uh, 150 ways you could say the same thing, and they all get the same code. So we use here the basic formal ontology, which is an accepted standard internationally. Um, many of the scientific ontologies that you see on the right have been uh, developed with this upper level ontology. And underneath that, there's the ontology of general medical sciences, which is a method for representing the course of a disease and also the, uh, the outcomes of a disease. And then we have underneath this what we call level three ontology, which is, uh, so level one is the is the upper level ontology, level two is the domain ontology, and level three is the details underneath it. And this has to be consistent with level one and level two ontologies, and the, the, the graph structures need to be assigned automatically because it's too much work for people to do it uh, by hand. And then the information must be in healthcare uh, generated through the usual process of documentation. And I have lots of experiments that we've done that have shown that in papers and, and our work. So in, in medicine, we generate uh, cases. This isn't a real case. It's one I dictated just like a real case. My secretary typed up, it's not a real person. Uh, doesn't get me in trouble with the HIPAA police. Um, it, and if we look at some of the outputs from this, this is an example of the encodings that can come from this kind of a, a document. You see that there's an awful large, lot of, of data that gets generated from even a small bit of text. And uh, we think that we expand the data about 144x. So if you give me a meg of data, I'll give you back 144 meg of output. And the, um, the idea is you need to be able to create both structures and uh, around this. And for every uh, entity that's found, we, we tag it as either a positive, negative, or uncertain assertion. 
So we can tell the difference between things that are true, things that are false, and things where you're not sure yet, where you're working the patient up. And in many fields, but certainly in medicine, we're always forming impressions, testing those impressions, and we don't get to real answers right away. We have to have a cycle of, of a workup strategy, getting data back, seeing how the patient progresses, seeing their response to treatment before we solidify on a diagnosis. And so we really need the ability to know the difference between things that are true, things that are false, and things that are in process where you they might be true or might be false. And I should say underneath this is really a seven-value architecture uh, on a scale from zero to one um, that, that we have under the covers, but we haven't really used more than the three pieces uh, in the applications that I'm going to show you later. But we validated the seven underneath it, and I can tell you how those pan out if you're interested. Um, so here's an example of a physical exam and the encodings from that, and you can see that there's positive, negative assertions within this, with the, this the color being positive and this color being negative. And here's the example of the history. Kind of leave it on the screen for a little bit. And then here's uh, some of the, of the physical examination. And you can see that the the system does not get everything, but it does get the lion's share of the of the content. We've also used this with our, with our research studies. So this is a description of a research trial that's ongoing in, at Buffalo, and here's an encoding of the data, and we use that in some of our applications to provide more specific uh, search retrieval. I will say that if you look at, it improves both the sensitivity of retrieval because it combines multiple ways you can represent surface forms, but what it really does is improve the specificity of the retrieval. So uh, sensitivities of retrievals are improved by something like 10 to 20 percent, but the, the specificities go from uh, a retrieval specificity in keyword searches of 20 to 33 percent to uh, up to 97.9 percent in some of our, our study results. So I was, wanted to talk to you about this project that we're doing on precision oncology. Think of this as AI meets patients directly. So this is where m many different clinicians can get together with artificial intelligence and primary data that's coming to them from clinical records, from laboratory testing, from, uh, from radiological image data, and from their underlying genetics and any proteomics that's been done. And now taking that data and everybody being able to give their opinions that are either formative or summative in order to provide better care for a single patient. This is uh, one of the things that I think is, is going to be the future of AI and medicine, where we're doing this more openly for everybody. Now, electronic tumor boards, when you have a tumor board, it's already been shown that patients who have cancer who go through a tumor board are more likely to have better outcomes. Only 10% of patients who have cancer are, have a tumor board availed to them because usually this means getting a lot of people together, having pizza and lunch and discussing a case, and there's only so many cases you can fit in during a lunchtime and only so many lunchtimes. So if we can set this up so it can be done asynchronously, uh, we think that it'll be availed by many more, if not all, cancer patients and probably should be everyone. And maybe this kind of team-based collaborative care can be a model for other kinds of serious diseases as well. And so we are very excited about this. This project was funded from the, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs um, through uh, uh, the ORD research and Maverick. And we're grateful to our uh, funding agency, but they're also our partners in doing this together. We're uh, building and designing and building this application which should be available open source to everybody. So we used the, the corporate data warehouse uh, and uh, the clinical record data at the VA uh, in order to create the, the AI-based medical models that will drive the AI in this. This is just a, a look at the schema from, the, uh, corporate data, from a, a set of the corporate data warehouse. And then we uh, work with the uh, people at the Million Vet Program and have 
um, access to that for some of our cancer patient uh, uh, studies. And we're creating these precision medical, uh, precision analytics, data analytics, for us to be able to know which genes are the correct panel of markers to let us know whether, for example, uh, people will progress uh, more rapidly to late stage lung cancer or whether they'll progress from uh, MGUS, which is a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, to multiple myeloma, for example, are a couple of the studies that are ongoing. Another part of our pathway that I wanted to talk about is actually uh, speeding uh, clinical research so that we can get better cures for you quicker. So we've created a, a pipeline where you could take a clinical genomic experiment where you find that, let's say, you have a biopsy of uh, someone's liver that has cancer and a biopsy of the liver where there isn't cancer, and you can tell what genes are up or down regulated in the cancer rather than the normal cells in the patient. And then I can take those and map them to all the metabolic regulatory and signaling pathways that we can extract from the open source literature in toto. And then we can narrow that to the cell type that we're interested in, so the alveolar cell um, uh, or the, um, uh, you know, the uh, any particular cell, so a liver cell in this case. So then we can take that and see which pathways light up with the up and down regulated uh, genes, and then we can filter out the ones that don't make metabolic sense and then enrich it with the rest of the pathways that our data set that are um, identified through the search through the metabolic regulatory and signaling pathways. Then we have a program called CANDU, which does 3D molecular mo modeling, at, where we can take all of the proteins in those pathways and we can model them. And we can dock against them using CANDOC all of the, the known drugs and, eat, and then new chemical entities by all the pieces of the known drugs uh, broken up by their rotatable bonds. So, in all the 19,000 drugs we have in the in the pharmacopoeia, they really only have 1,600 uh, rigid pieces. We can take those pieces and build new drugs out of them and dock them against all the binding sites of each of these proteins and get things from there directly into testing in cell culture, testing then in, uh, in uh, uh, organoids, which are 3D cell culture models, then uh, right to PDX mice, and then quickly into phase one clinical trials and try to shorten the 17 years that uh, that it takes now to go from bench to bedside and to maybe cut it by half if we can, which is the challenge we've been given by our president of our university, Dr. Tripathi. Um, and then we have uh, a uh, data center within the Department of Veteran Affairs, and, and there's a part in the block in the center is the detailed data from that. And what we do is we're creating representational forms of each of these different um, input data sources. So we take the imaging data and we create the, the matrices and the vectors that you can parse out of them based on feature recognition into their immediate, intermediate forms that can then be available for machine learning. And we do the same thing with the genetic data indexing those things that are up or down regulated to different diseases. And then we take the clinical data and we parse out using our HTP NLP, all of the features of the, um, of the data and put that into these NoSQL and the graph and, and triple store databases. And then those are also available to machine learning algorithms. In our, um, and then we create these models, you know, out of the machine learning our algorithms in order to be partners with the, the different specialties of physicians in caring for an individual patient uh, up to populations. So we're very excited about this, and we're also doing the genomic data common submissions for the Precision Oncology Project of the of the VA, and uh, that's what the the data design is about. And the idea is to get to where we can do precision oncology and have that knowledge representation inform these uh, AI based models that will be used to take better care of patients. And the whole idea in the long run is to bring us to a um, learning healthcare system model. So if we get these models and then we constantly get feedback on the outcomes of the patients that we use, we should be able to, over time, learn from these uh, educatable models, improve our AI, and help 
physicians uh, in partnership to take better care of, of patients. And I, I believe there's a tremendous opportunity both on the efficacy and the patient safety side of things in order to improve the way patients are cared for. So you guys who are doctors on the phone, you didn't know that you were taking care of patients with your work. But when you do it and it helps patients, you really are. And I, I want to emphasize that because it's, it's really a noble thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use this for healthcare quality in our region. So we define value as quality over cost and quality as outcome safety and service. We need reliability of these measures. And if you take the, the famous book from uh, Harvard, from Kaplan and Norton, The Balanced Scorecard, they say you can't manage what you can't measure, you can't measure what you can't describe. And that's how I got down to doing knowledge representation. The way I like to explain it to people is we take technology and connect it with people using process. You know, and these are our models in one way or another, from their, their top-down or bottom-up models, they're all models. So we've gotten a lot of good press about this. We were published the first articles and, and started, they coined the term equality or electronic quality monitoring, and that's been part of healthcare reform and also uh, the change from, uh, from volume-based payments to physicians to value-based payments to physicians. And uh, there's been some very nice press that we've gotten about it. We also created a, a trans EMR EMR that once you put things into these observational databases, then you can look at all of them. And we created a, an extensible model where you can also do studies in it where you can actually design these little widgets where people who are reviewing full EMR data can, uh, can make decisions about patients and save it and helps you to do your ground truthing in uh, whatever study you're doing. So we're part of a network. This is one of our, our payers, uh, IHA, and uh, we went from over here to up here by giving people pop, uh, uh, feedback in terms of the quality of care they're providing. This is an example of uh, the report cards that we give patients every month, and it tells you how you're doing, how your peers are doing, and what your goal is, and what we need to meet. And uh, they get this every month. These are diabetic measures, coronary disease measures, we also have preventative measures like colorectal cancer screening, uh, mammogram screening, chlamydia screening for and cervical you know, pap smears, uh, how many people got their flu shot and, and also pneumovaxes that were supposed to get them, and then how many people were on corticosteroid uh, inhalers that had moderate to severe asthma, and how many people who have uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, or emphysema are getting a spirometry every year. And then we can track it over time. I did this in a very uh, rigorous way where we did a year back. Each dot is a year back, so it won't progress fast, but you can trust the data that there's not seasonal variation in it. Um, and you can see that things are, are uh, improving for this provider. And, uh, and there's some odd months, but that's true. And then we roll it up to the practices. And here's one of our practices and their quality data. And then there's another one of our practices, the MedPeds group and their quality data for a year. And this is the, one of the first studies we ever published which looked at uh, how we could take very subjective things and model the underlying uh, indicators. And then we use machine learning uh, to identify the correct uh, codes to use in these models. And then we use those models in order to surveil the quality of care that people are providing and provide feedback either in real time as in this VA study or, or in uh, uh, every month, as in the quality measures that we give our physicians. Now, we want to not have only technology people have access to our work. So we created uh, an interface we call the BMI Investigator. And the BMI Investigator is a, is a tool that allows us to query in a sort of, uh, I know there's some Google people on the line, the Google kind of way, where one input line, um, the anything they want about the clinical record. When you type in here, it goes into both the structured and formally unstructured data and gives you back results very quickly. You specify what ontology you want to use, what, whether you want positive, negative, uncertain assertions, or it not mentioned, and whether you want to explode it, which means you want all the subtypes, what part of the record, if there are values you put them in, and times, and then you generate the query, and uh, then comes up with the results very quickly. So for anxiety, we found in this population of 212,000 people, 32,000 and change, 
who have uh, some anxiety that they're reporting. If you look at who reported it, we can quickly get to race, ethnicity, uh, gender, and age ranges. You can see that women about twice as often as men will be willing to report that they have anxiety to their clinician. And this kind of data comes up very quickly. Here's an example of a, a, a smart way clinicians make the practice better. Someone came into my office and said, you know, I think my patients who have rosacea, which is an uh, autoimmune rash you get on the face, um, are more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. Here's the study design. And what we found was the following, that the chance of rosacea without, uh, sorry, the chance of obstructive sleep apnea without rosacea was only 2.6%. With rosacea, it was 8.8%. If you look at the chi-square on this, it was highly statistically significant. That's a, a, a 3.4-fold uh, risk, and, uh, and the number needed to treat is only 12. Anything less than 50 is a good screening test. And in this case, all it means the physician has to do is every rosacea patient should get a set of screening questions about uh, obstructive sleep apnea to pick out who should be going on for further testing. So it's low cost, high yield and can really help patients. And you can find out things like this in five minutes. You did the whole study in five minutes. So that's the nice thing. We can change the paradigm. I can get trainees to do uh, studies uh, at every rotation and, uh, and in every, uh, every uh, month that they're on service. This is an example of how we represented the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program in the same kind of rule-based method using uh, AI to generate the models and, uh, and showed in a high impact uh, publication that this was, um, that this was fairly, very effective and that instead of 10% of 10 charts on every surgeon, they're all, uh, every year we can do all of their charts all the time using an electronic based uh, program to do this. We did it for the CDC and was able to, um, improve the ability of them, of the CDC to know we're in the flu season. It was much more effective than the past way of doing it and ended up with a, a excellent data model. This kind of ROC curve is the same as like exercise stress testing with, uh, with radioactive nucleotides in terms of its uh, ex, uh, excellence uh, in terms of being a good, a good test. Uh, and then I wanted to share with you one more uh, study. So we did this study, it was funded by Pfizer, I should uh, tell you, and this was using AI and natural language processing to enhance our understanding of non-valvular atrial fibrillation and people's risk of stroke and bleeding. Um, and we did it using two validated scales that are out there, the Chads, Vask, and Hesblad scale. And what we did was we had a couple of research questions. One. And it was the right research question. If we take unstructured data at NLP and we add it to what we know in structured data, how much of an improvement in accuracy would we get? And uh, I think that's the right question to ask. There have been a lot of studies that said, is using NLP and unstructured data better than using structured data alone? But that's not the right question. But the right question, again, was if you have unstructured data already, um, what does adding to it um, uh, the unstructured data give you as additional power. And then we wanted to see what kind of benefit we could provide by patients. And so we used semi-supervised machine learning where we had a small amount of labeled data, a large amount of unlabeled data. This, of course, is, is much cheaper and faster than full supervised approaches where you have to vault tag data and, uh, and more accurate than the unsupervised approach and, and create this model. And uh, there's a little uh, explanation on on, on, uh, on super, uh, semi-supervised machine learning that I thought was kind of cute. Um, and then these are a couple of other pu uh, publications that I think we've done that if anyone wants to look them up, but I'm going to go on with this particular talk. But this shows the accuracy of the structured plus versus the structured plus unstructured. And in identifying, we had 96,681 patients in this part of the trial. And what we did was we looked for how well we could identify the true population of non-valvular AFib. And it turned out that we could actually find an additional 873 cases and it, than you can with just structured ICD codes. It turns out that what we think we have for a population in this country that's based on this uh, structured data that's available in claims is shy by about 36.3%. And that's, that's kind of sad that we're missing that uh, high a percent of the true positive population of non-valvular AFib patients. You can see that the, the uh, structured plus NLP 
looks a lot more like the gold standard than the, um, the structured data alone, and that's true for both the CHADS-VASC and the HASBLED results, and that by formal statistical testing, it was better as well. I'll leave the data for you to look at. And here are the ROC curves, which show that the, the structured plus NLP method was uh, superior uh, overall and provides a very strong analytic test. Um, and then uh, we also looked at uh, who would benefit from uh, oral anticoagulation and was not on it. And uh, then we expanded our population using claims data to try to get a population that would help us to generalize our results to the population in the United States. So here we took uh, two payers' data, Optum and Truvum, that we had access to, and they had 63 million, 296, 121 patients. When you look at, at uh, the rate of, they have a, a little healthier population than the entire United States, so our numbers are actually conservative. Um, there, uh, there's only 1.52%. We think 2.8% is the right number for the country. Um, that uh, it turned out that of that, 4.44% of people who were untreated had strokes every year, and that 5.99% of those people who had strokes passed away, and that for everybody who had a stroke, the additional cost in that year, in the next year, on average over a five-year period and adjusted for inflation was $99,041 per patient. So if you look at, at what the impact of that is, um, there would be another 4 million people who would be treated. It would lead to preventing 182,000 strokes just in the first year, saving over 10,900 people's lives, and a savings to the country just in the first year of $18 billion. And this is only for one disorder. Imagine if we, as a community, did this for every disorder. How much of an impact would that have on, on the country's uh, both economics and health? And, uh, and if you think about it, some of these cases are gonna be during people's working productive life. So the full impact of uh, these negative events is not only the cost of their care. And so this is a very impactful way that AI can really help uh, improve the quality and the and actually the the longevity of people in our country. This is the circulation publication, and it was presented at the American Heart Meeting. Um, and so some of the conclusions are that NLP is not only highly accurate but also provides transactional speeds that make it practical. Uh, we now can do this very very fast. Uh, we we can get uh, um, you know seven million notes in an hour parsed. Uh, then. This is available for academic partnerships. It's also uh, uh, practically you need to implement this sort of thing if you want to try to move towards semantic interoperability. We have a lot of people doing syntactic interoperability, but there's, even though we talk about it, very little semantic interoperability out there. And this is the kind of thing you need to do cross-validation of data from different data types. So if you want to know it, that you have a diagnosis, and it's also in the diagnosis field, in the problem list, but it's also in the clinician's notes, and it's also in the lab test values, and you can make the diagnosis by image data, and they have genes that put them at risk for this, you have very strong indication that somebody really has that diagnosis. And then these standardized phenotypes when they're built are completely shareable across populations and across, uh, across um, healthcare organizations and across organizations that may want to use that data. And then clinical decision support can really, through artificial intelligence, can really help patients uh, and, and help clinicians take care of them. And I believe that, that biomedical informatics and AI partnering with clinicians towards safer and more effective clinical care. Uh, and I, by the way, clinical informatics is new uh, American Board of Medical Specialties approved specialty that doctors are getting certified in. Uh, and they take a board test just like a cardiologist or a GI person. And if those of you who haven't seen this uh, graph, the whole idea really is to go from uh, for precision medicine to impl through implementation science to create uh, better health for our population and then to create a learning health system by having this uh, be a constantly renewable uh, activity. Um, this is a set of courses that we're building through an NLVM NL grant that will be available. Um, and NLP is very, a very viable solution that uh, we uh, actually have a sensitivity or recall of 99.7% and a precision of 99.8%.
which is a quite a quite a good result. Um, and so we're going to change it, uh, you know, so that the machines are always watching, and, and when humans go to make errors, it's going to actually work with them to stop those errors from touching patients and other things. I'll just close with two quotes that are my favorite. Um, one is that Matt by Machiavelli, which was just as true in 1505 as it is today, there's nothing more difficult to take at hand, more perilous to conduct, more uncertain in its success than to take the lead of the introduction of a new order of things, because the innovator has for entities all the all those who've done well under the old conditions and only work alone, lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new. Um, and that's just as true today as it was back in 1505. But I'll leave you with my, my favorite quote, which is uh, by Peter Drucker at Harvard, who said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Please come and create the future with us. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran a little bit long. Apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, very, very uh, insightful and interesting uh, presentation. Uh, uh, we will switch to Q and A. We've been uh, seeing a lot of uh, questions, so uh, um, Rose and I have a uh, quick summary. So, Ro Rose, do you want to start by asking a few questions? I think we have a time for just a couple. A couple, yeah, um, sure. Okay, Peter, here's here's a question. Training for NLP data seems like it's a difficult problem given that the vocabulary changes over time and across institutions as well as across providers within an institution. How do you overcome this? So um, by using semi-supervised techniques and by doing lots of records, we can over time really close the gap. So at the VA, for example, there's 30 million patients, which is a large subset. You can get access uh, to um, to uh, other corpora that are available as open source data sets that are available online in addition to your, which you can get nationally and locally. Um, but I agree with the person who probably had the sentiment and wanted to hear that more of our annotated data sets should be made available online for everyone to use, and I do agree with that. And we can do it using these codes in an anonymized way. So if you imagine, let's say we've coded everything and we've got at least gold standard to a certain level of accuracy, then we can use that as a gold standard without human review and to be the, the preliminary data that people use in their AI-based systems. And then as we get more data, inform feedback and inform the gold standard so it becomes uh, a, an ever-improving, asymptotically correct gold standard, um, which I think would be the right thing to do in a hoping that that's why the person asked the question. They wanted to hear that answer. Uh, yeah, we might have just time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. Um, there's another one kind of on that line. When you process so many disparate reports to normalize the data for combination, how do you assure that there are not misinterpretations by the process? Uh, so in the uh, experiments that we do, which are often like this, we have uh, clinicians review the the information and score them and we always have multiple clinicians and then where they disagree a third person adjudicates to so get a very strong gold standard on a subset of the information and then uh, what we have and I didn't talk about this is we've created a level of synonymy a hierarchical level of synonymy where we have each of the sources of synonyms are considered what we call a sin set we published an article about that uh, I think last year, and the idea is that whenever there's a, a case that comes up where we get the wrong thing for one reason or another, there's a false positive, false negative, we can know not only what the NLP method was that got that, but also if there was a synonym set involved that, that led to the match, and we can continue to edit it. And where there's um, just variation in language that can't be resolved, we can do things like uh, use knowledge artifacts, like we have sets of specialty specific synonymy that helps us to do that. And then we have machine learning based statistical algorithms that when you, you have to get down to a guess can actually make that guess uh, in the way that uh, is most likely to be right, um, rather than that is truly known to be right. And we can capture these um, uncertainties, work on them over time and use knowledge engineering along with um, artificial intelligence and computer science to uh, get closer and closer to perfection. 
All right. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take one more, one last question, and then we're, we'll wrap up. Um, can you speak to the use of deep learning on NLP problems in the healthcare big data domain? Yeah, I think, um, and this is what I would encourage you to look at, um, and part of what I was proselytizing here is that if you take your deep learning algorithms and you build them on top of the linguistically identified uh, content, your deep learning algorithm will be both more accurate and have better uh, elasticity. And, and so when you go to do your sensitivity analyses, it will actually be uh, less sensitive to, uh, to uh, lack of data and, uh, and changes in data sources than if you look at the text primarily. And that's because you've normalized a lot of the language to a common meaning. And by doing that, you really do improve the, the ability, the specificity of the information, which is your primary data source. Um, I have not seen machine learning algorithm, deep, sorry, deep learning algorithms that worked on primary text or natural language uh, processing that had accuracies that were anywhere, except in, in very narrow domains and often overtrained, but in the general case that they got results anywhere close to what we're getting. If someone's seen it, they can send it to me, please. Uh, by the way, my email is elkinp at buffalo.edu, elkinp at buffalo.edu. If anybody would like to follow up personally, um, I throw that out there for the group. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time today. And I'd, so I'd like to thank you, Peter, again, for um, the informative pre presentation and the answers to the questions. There's several more. Um, that, that we'll, we'll be able to look at afterwards. And a special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend today. Um, this, there's, the ACM Learning will continue uh, with additional webinars uh, that the SIG AI will have um, coming, up in next, well, coming up next year. You can also click on any of these links to see any of the SIG AI or ACM um, information. Uh, that we have. And, and there's one last thing. This is the, the link to the um, survey. Uh, you can suggest future topics or speakers. Um, if, you, if anybody on would please uh, do a quick survey, uh, that, would be, that would be very helpful for us. Uh, so on behalf of the ACM, SIG AI, Peter Elkin, Plum and Petrov, and myself, Rose Paradis, Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again in our next webinar in January. Um, and if you take the survey, that would be very helpful. And um, look at the SIG AI pages and join our group um, if, you, if you would like to. Um, this concludes our webinar. Uh, the webinar will be available, has, has a uh, video um, in several days. And you'll be getting an email about that if you've registered for it. Thank you, everyone.